Hello and welcome again to Future Multilingual. Um, today is a red letter day. We have with us Dr. Garcia from La Universidad de los Andes here in Bogota, Colombia. Welcome, Dr. Garcia. Thank you, James. Um, Dr. Garcia is going to talk about her fascinating research into the perception of uh, vowel sounds and, and, and it sort of touch, it goes on. Uh, on pronunciation and and types of knowledge from a neurological perspective. So, Dr. Garcia, before we start talking about the research, what 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 sort of motivated you to become interested in this area of research? Uh, well, when I moved to New York to to do my masters in neuroscience and education. I came across with situations in which I was not being understood, but not, on, not only not being understood, but being misunderstood and shamed by what I was saying. And one example of that was I was at a, um, at a store and I was yelling at my friend in another aisle of the store asking if I could get a can I say this in this recording? It's not a nice word. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying, um, can you get me a sheet of stickers? And she was like, what? <laughs> what did you say? No, don't say that, Paula. And I could not understand what I was, what the problem was. I was like, what did I say? And okay. then she explained to me that there was this difference between sheet and shit. And yeah. And then I was like, really? Okay. Oh, what does that mean? Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a and, problem. Of and this is, a, at this moment, you were still pronunciation, sorry. So, no, I was saying this was the instance of the pronunciation of the words was the issue. But what I realized before, after that, it was not just the pronunciation, it was the speech perception, how, was, how, I, how I was perceiving the sounds. And because of the perception, how I was producing the sounds. And that led me to this research. And, and I mean, by this stage, obviously, you had spent many, many years acquiring English because you were doing the master's degree in English, no? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay. that's right. So I, I, wow. I learned, I started learning English very late in life compared to other people. I was 21. By the uh -huh. time I was doing my master's, I was 31. Okay. Mm, yeah. And so I had been studying English for 10 years. And by the time I, I was surviving a master's, but at, not, at that particular detail of the language, I was not aware of yet. Mm -hmm. And so how long after that was it? that you realized that this was going to form the basis of your PhD research? So I, I, I did my master's, my master's thesis on the vowel contrast, this one, e, yeah. e, understanding the perception of, of those vowels. And then I realized that though that contrast was very, say very well studied already, very common. But there, there were other contrasts that were equally complicated for, for late bilingual adults. Um, and are these all about length of vowels or are these are totally different mm -hmm. things? So, well, when you think about uh, what we know about speech perception and vowel perception, um, we know the vowels are distinguished by different cues. Mm -hmm. Some cues are duration, the length, but some other cues okay. are spectral. And those spectral cues are related to the position of the tongue in the okay. oral cavity. And so some contrasts are distinguished by duration, and some other mm -hmm. contrasts are mainly distinguished by spectral cues. So the position of the tongue and the, the position up and down and back yeah. and forth. And, okay. um, and so when you think about Spanish vowels, yeah. I had learned to perceive my vowels in terms of spectral cues. 
okay. because of the position. And I didn't know about duration and, and I didn't know about that. Internally. Subconsciously, <laughs> all of Subconsciously. this is. So my, my perceptual system was not trained to perceive the small difference in spectral cues in okay. American English vowels. Hmm? Okay, okay. And it's interesting the vowel sounds, no? Because I, I, while you were talking there, I was thinking of like the research into English as a lingua franca, the Jennifer Jenkins research. Mm -hmm. And when she's denoting sort of aspects of pronunciation that make a difference for people's understanding, one of the key ones she picks up on is length of vowels, no? That it, it, you know, it can have a big effect on people's understanding of you. It is, uh, it is actually vowels. So for intelligibility, vowels are key more than consonants. Yeah. And so that's, mm -hmm. what, that's when we get confused, basically. And because this contrast, the meaning contrast are signaled by those differencing in vowels. They might okay. not be only length, they might be uh -huh. old, but length is the most available, like auditorily and consciously for people to understand compared so to the spectral cues. When she talks about length and quality, what's she referring to in terms of quality? Probably uh, she's referring to the spectral cues. Okay. Why, when I mean the, the position of the tongue and, and the pitch and all those um, acoustic characteristics that are not necessarily related to um, the language per se, uh -huh. but help us understand the difference between those for meaning. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So um, your research then is both into the perception and the production of the vowel sounds. It's only about perception actually. Okay, oh, that's right. So far, only okay. I'm, I'm in perception. So bec because uh, the, the, okay. the production you, was so can... obvious. Go ahead. No, 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 continue, continue. No, I was just saying that because of the production is what we see and what signaled communication, what's, what's out there, what we can concretely name. We think that uh, pronunciation is just what we hear or what we don't hear. But pronunciation is also related to perception. And so because of that, I went back to the processing and I wanted to understand how is that perception of the vowels, uh, first of all, I mean, describe that and see what happens there first in order to understand this other process that is related, which is uh, production. So one of the things that might be confusing people at this stage is how, <laughs> how did you understand what was going on in the unseen brain? Okay. So because perception is not something that we can describe just by observing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we need to use um, different te experimental techniques. And so you can, um, you can think of asking people why they, what they hear and uh, ask them to say what they hear. See, if I say uh, house or boat, people can say house or boat. And I say, okay, you heard what I said. But when you think about vowels and these vowel contrasts that are so similar to each other and that are so foreign to second language learners or foreign language learners, then there are some characteristics that you need to carefully manipulate to make sure people are uh, perceiving and perceiving those differences. So what you need to understand or what I had to understand first was to uh, um, one, that everything comes through the ear and that might be something um, that we all understand, but when things come through the ear, they also come with noise. And so the ear and the brain have to filter this, those noise or the noise in order mm -hmm. for the actual signal to get to the brain and mm -hmm. to be mapped into the brain 
So I know that okay. I ha that I heard a e, no e, or a in my, in the middle yeah. of the noise, right? So okay, yeah. um, okay, so yeah. if I if I want to under, if if I want to see that do I or adults like me who learned English after being adults can perceive this difference between American English vowels, then I had these um, not not only these tasks to ask people what they hear, but also I had in the lab in Teachers College Columbia University, I I I, I had this um, equipment that allow us to record electrical um I, I i i miss the word electrical activity from the brain while the brain is receiving these vowels and so basically what i did was to create two different words uh, and they were my pronunciation may not reflect the difference in this in these vowels but they were like in luck and gum or duck and duck can you perceive the difference that i'm trying to make james because i don't know can you duck? repeat those okay yeah du duck? Say, can you say them one more time because i lost it for a second which okay. one is it duck like in the place where boats um are duck no, I can't. Can you say it again? Okay, let's see. Uh -huh. Doc. It is D O C K. Doc. Ah, uh, doc. Yeah. Doc. Yeah. Okay. That's one. That vowel in that word. Okay. And the other is. Yeah, I can hear okay. that the second one is shorter than the first one. No. So, because yeah. I I don't know I I'm not an expert in the pronunciation of those vowel contrasts, I cannot tell you exactly. So I understand what happens, but I cannot pronounce the difference between the vowels yet. Okay, is, is okay. That, and is that because that's to do with the perception of this lens? That, that, that might be because I don't have the category, the category, the phonemic or the phonetic category in my brain. And so this is interesting, these phonetic categories, no? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, look, there's a lot of talk in language acquisition. One of the big hot topics is always critical periods, no? Mm -hmm. And some people, they love the idea of critical periods and they want to apply it to everything. And some people, they hate the idea of critical periods mm -hmm. and they want to apply it to nothing. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is potentially there is a critical period for pronunciation and specifically for phonem the phonemes. The, the creation of the, phonem of the phonetic categories, yes. Uh, there is happens, a critical period. Mm -hmm. So you can learn your whole life. The brain is plastic. Neuroplasticity is teaching us that the brain has the ability to learn from before you're born till you're dead. That's, that's something that uh, there's evidence for that. So you can learn. However, but, uh, okay. there, no. are, there are yeah. periods in time where this learning happens in different ways. And so okay. when you're learning, yeah. when you're perceiving for the first time your um, sounds, which is before the first year of life, your perceptual system is shaped by those sounds that you perceive and so so a, a child with bilingual parents would be developing more sound categories than a child of monolingual parents potentially exactly because okay. it's exposed to those and so the brain adjusts to the input in that case and so it creates all those what i call boxes of sounds yeah and i found so, this term one of the most in, well everything was interesting this was very interesting i thought in your research the idea of sound categories no mm -hmm. yeah and, and, and so we're creating those in the first what year through is it, how year. long did you say first so, year of our lives in the first year that system gets specialized in the sounds of your language so in my case and the case of people who learn uh, another language later in life 
you start learning new categories with a specialized with a specialized uh, system that needs to adjust. But can, can I just go back a bit, not in our interview, but in the life of the child? <laughs> and so, what if my I take my child to uh, an Arabic speaking country when they're five years old? Is my because my understanding is that my child can still develop more sound categories at that age, no? Mm -hmm. And I can also develop more sound categories at this age. It's just that there are some sound categories that are more difficult to develop, acquire, create, as long as we're uh, getting older. But it doesn't mean that you can't. It's just that I have Okay. <laughs> and, and I mean, presumably, huge amounts of input in English that you have received, especially over your time in New York. So you haven't developed those, you don't think you've developed those sound categories. Um, well, I don't know, because if I do research on myself, I might get some results, but this is not a diagnostic. So doing research in speech perception requires tons and, th and tons of data to make conclusions and okay. doing research in one person is not that, oh, you have the categories or you don't have the categories. I may infer that I don't have the categories and I might infer that there are other processes that are not native-like in my process of learning because when I produce those sounds, they are mm -hmm. not as intelligible as other people. And I get confused and people get confused. That's my evidence. So, mm -hmm. then my next question is, to what extent is that universal? Or, because another hot potato, perhaps, is to what extent everybody's language acquisition functions in the same way, and to what extent people's language acquisition functions in different ways? Well, uh, we, we all have brains, and we have language systems and cognitive systems that when typically developing, they assist you or they, they are ready for you to learn whatever, whatever language, how many languages you want, right? Or the languages you're mm -hmm. exposed to. And mm -hmm. that could say, we could say that could be in typical terms, that could be the same for all of us, right? The baseline mm -hmm. in terms of biology could be very similar. Maybe not equal, of... but very similar. Okay. Right? But then we have context. And so yeah. how and so that's when the big, big differences come. And that's when making conclusions or generalizations about learning languages is challenging because now mm -hmm. it is very hard to control all those contextual uh, factors that affect the way you learn in the way you express and the way when you learn it, how you learn it, for how long you've been learning, uh, among others. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, another one is you. Just, I mean, it's real because you know, people often talk about how much input they've had. It's so hard <laughs> to exactly. know how much input people have had. No, um, so am I safe to say that sort of? We have all evolved in the same way cognitively, pretty much, but it's this outside area that cannot be controlled and therefore it is very hard to make generalizations. Exactly, exactly. And so when you see papers that generalize things, you yeah. might look for uh, lots of data, ways to analyze those data and get to those conclusions. Yeah. Uh, but even so, when, when you read those papers, you always find limitations in terms of what they can actually say based on the population they have. I, I mean, it's incredible though, because I always remember reading, is it Richard Schmidt? Yeah, the guy with the noticing hypothesis. The whole book seems to be based on three people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, right, um, so, <laughs> I apologize in advance if I get this wrong. 
I think in the paper you use a similar term to Van Patten. No, you use a sort of uh, uh, meant uh, abstract, implicit mental representations or something similar. No, for the sound categories. Am I right in that? Is my memory serving me right? I'm not sure I use that expression like exactly like that. But yes, the categories are mental representation of those sounds. In that, okay. And they are abstract. <laughs> and implicit, no? And or implicit. No? Yeah, implicit. Unless, so same... unless you go through and, and make them explicit, but in, in general, they are implicit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think people have a, something that puts people off mm -hmm. looking at research is, to, is this idea of mental representations or implicit mental representations. So can can you just help us to understand the different types of knowledge that we're talking about here when compared to maybe other things that we know? Okay, so you can read a word and you visually see the traces and you see it is a P, right? And you mm -hmm. completely can see that, but you cannot see sound. And so that's that's what makes it very difficult to grasp. However, you can hear, and that sound makes meaning for communities of people who share the same symbols. Sounds mm -hmm. become symbols, right? And mm -hmm. they become symbols that you can produce. But then uh, if we think about how the acoustic signal, which is a bunch of um, impulses, get mm -hmm. to the uh, mem tympanic membrane and then okay. get to the cochlea in the ear, they get yeah. mapped into frequencies of okay. uh, energy, right? They become okay. energy, but when they become energy, they go to the brain and in the brain, those frequencies become mental representations of those frequencies, meaning phonemes. And then you put those phonemes together to come to make words and then sentences and then so this okay wow so the frequencies that you are exposed to as a child produce the mental representations in your brain exactly and it is those mental representations that you use to process not just your first language but other languages that you learn as an adult exactly exactly so if you have wow. hearing loss or yeah hearing loss then you will get some frequencies but not some other frequencies so you won't be able to map those sounds into your brain and your communication would differ from those who have full range of hearing as a, as a hearing loss even at a later age will have effects on your pronunciation. Yes. Ah, it affects your pronunciation, mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. And so it's certain frequencies that you're not getting. So you would be getting parts of words, but not enough to extract the meaning. Or you can yes. compensate because your cognitive system helps you compensate. And if you okay. had the hearing loss when you were adult and you had all this exposure to sounds, and not yeah. in, in language that would help you get along so, with those. So subconsciously, your mind knows this sound generally goes with this sound. Yeah, <laughs> and so it I fills mean, in the gaps. And, and, and it is, it is the, let's say, the perfection of the system because it, it compensates okay. now. It recruits other uh, parts of the brain and the auditory system to make sure you're still communicating. And, uh, and yeah. this brings me on to another interesting point I thought from your research because I think what people might be thinking is hold on, hold on a minute. Dr. Garcia is saying that there's certain sounds I can't hear, but how come? And this I think you just touched on how come I'm understanding words that contain these sounds? Mm -hmm. Exactly, because you're. Um, your cognitive system is compensating or filling the gaps or uh, completing what is missing 
it's like completing the form when you have dots and you just have to trace the, the dots and make make this, I mean, bird or yeah. something. That, that's uh -huh. what happens. If you have missing dots, you can complete at some up, up to some point because if there are so many missing points, then you cannot make it. And then you need a hearing aid or some, some, some kind so of... So you're not, yeah, okay. So your brain can only fill in so much. It needs a certain amount of mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the impression I got was that some people, I mean, I, I may be wrong here. I think this was in the introduction to the research. It was the other papers and the, so it was the other papers that huge amounts of input can potentially lead to people being able to perceive these sounds, or is that not true? As an adult, I mean. Yes, um, it could be true. There are, there's evidence that some specific types of training, auditory perceptual training, may facilitate the perception of difficult contrast, let's say, difficult vowel and consonant contrasts, and people okay. can actually um, produce and perceive those that were not there before the training. And, and this, is, this is what, listening training? Yes, but it's listening, uh, manipulating those cues that I was talking about, uh, spectral cues and duration cues. Okay. And Usually what those trainings do is highlight uh, some uh, cues and attenuate other cues, manipulate them so you focus your system on those. And that needs to be explicit. And how, how easy is this training to do? Hmm. When you read the papers, it looks like it's a lot of work. But I guess once okay. you have the, the training in place, um, it is just a matter of doing it. It's not, it's not guarantee, you know, individual difference and, and, and context. And you cannot just uh, control for, that, for all of that. But it requires <laughs> lots, lots of repetition and attention. And this is what I found in my, in my research in terms of the, the role of attention in discriminating the vowel contrast. So we've we've let me get this right. So if you're no if you are if you are if somehow somebody devises some way to help you notice these things that can help because it I mean I think it is interesting because I mean you yourself have obviously been massively immersed in the English language and yet you're saying that this perception hasn't this this change in these categories has not happened for you mm -hmm. so <laughs> fascinating I mean and, and and presumably you know five years or how well six years but I don't know how long your master's and PhD took that if it was going to happen it would have happened in that time no yeah yeah, I was living in, in the United States for 12 years, actually. I lived nine oh years God. in New York and three years in Omaha, Nebraska. And so I had lots of Okay. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I would like to maybe ask you a question about what more it's possible to know about language learning. So, like... I read your colleague's paper, Dr. Sanchez, on mm -hmm. reading and how new, new learners as adults were using a completely different part of the brain to fluent readers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe people are really, into, some people really want to get involved in the idea of explicit and implicit knowledge of grammar, for example. Is this something that it is possible to see? And would it be possible to see whether there is trans, because that is another big debate, no? Transfer. To, from one language to the other, you said, you mean? No, from explicit to implicit knowledge. Oh, I see. Because, you know, yeah. obviously there's certain people who say you've got to acquire it implicitly. You cannot 
<laughs> you cannot transfer from X. Would it be possible to see those things? Well, um, I'm thinking, well, first, yes, you can, you can learn a lot uh, about grammar, syntax, and everything about language with uh, electrophysiology, for example, which is the technique I used. So, and we know from those te techniques that uh, there are processes that happen very, very early when you first get the input. And when I mean, when I say early, it's 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds after the sound is presented. And so there are many things that happen way before you know they're happening, right? So they and must be implicit, no? Of course, they are implicit. And so in, in my, in my um, study, what we did was to present this vowel contrast. I'm going to say mm -hmm. again, doc and doc mm -hmm. um, to, sure. to those adults <laughs> in two conditions. In one, they were distracted by a video but they were okay. using earphones. Okay. And we presented the sounds through earphones, but they were watching okay. a silent movie. Okay. And they were wearing a cup with 128 electrodes. So we uh, could get uh, the electrical signal that okay. could, be, um, could be there when the sounds were presented. And so when they were, we were presenting, let's say, Bob, 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 Bob. See? So it's, it's a, a, a train of the same sounds, and that train is interrupted by a different sound. And this is called the old bot paradigm. And so what we try to do with that is to uh, uh, make the brain react to the different one. OK. So th they weren't physically reacting to anything. You no, were looking okay. for reactions in their brain. In the brain. This is, they wow. have no, there's no attention involved. This is not attention at all. Okay. Because if this happens, this reaction happens between 100 and 300 milliseconds after the sound is presented. So it's very early. You don't have time to think about that. And this is why the distraction. It's interesting because that's what Rod Ellis is doing. I, saw, I read some of his work where he was mm -hmm. trying to see if people knew things implicitly and he was using also distractions. Exactly. Yeah. So no attention involved. Actually, you have to distract the person so they don't pay attention to, to the sound. Yeah. And so what we found with this is that we had two groups a group of bilinguals, they bilinguals, people who learned English after being 15. Okay. And people of uh, in American English monolingual adults. Okay. And, and what we saw was that there was not this response to the difference, to the different sound in the in, bilinguals. Okay. Even, so, uh, I mean, irrespective of their level of the language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're not processing that implicitly, no? They, yeah. Based on that, we could say that they didn't have the category because the brain was not responding to that. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, okay. However, Interesting. when mm -hmm. we ask them to do the same, I mean, to listen to the same sounds in the same old world paradigm, um, yeah. but they, I, we asked them to press the button when they heard in that case was gum and lock. That was the example we used. Gum uh -huh. and lock. Oh, okay. Oh, there, but then it, oh, yeah, yeah, go, uh, lock. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Go, uh, my knowledge of phonetics is not good enough here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know, I know the theory, but the practice is not that well developed. <laughs> well, it uh, shows explicit and implicit knowledge again. Uh -huh. <laughs> And so, and so we asked them to press a button every time uh -huh. they were, there was one sound presented. And wow. when they were pressing the button, yeah. uh, the responses show that they could make the difference. They could uh, perceive luck, but not gum. <laughs> wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to sort of, I think what I'm learning from this is how hard it is to look at a behavior and understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it is it is challenging it is challenging and 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 th this could, so like I, I i wanted to ask one final uh, question where you know we're all the viewers and and me we're not we're not neurologists we're mm -hmm. we're language learners mm -hmm. and so what do you think in the future this time, because I'm, I know that's one of the big things at Columbia, no? Is looking at how they can inform language learning practice and how you guys can inform language learning practice. So I think that's my final question. How can you guys <laughs> inform language acquisition practice? Mm -hmm. So at this point uh, uh, in Colombia and in the, I, I am part of the, bilingualism and multilingualism a research group in uh, the School of Education. Okay. And this group have been working on the communication part of the learning language or of the language, right? And so they've been focusing on interculturality and um, how to make meaning of this communication, right? And um, mm -hmm. not so much on the cogn cognitive and perceptual areas. And so what okay. we have been doing now is to try to understand from different levels and that that implies a perceptual, cognitive, social, pedagogic, all these levels, what it means to learn a language. So it's not just perception, but it's not just uh, being able to communicate effectively, because if you don't perceive and you don't produce well, then the communication is affected. But understanding how all these factors uh, intersect and mm -hmm. how teachers yeah. can think of this and keep them in mind to design classes to design evaluation to design experiences where people where students can communicate and that makes it more um, concrete right applied to the classroom it is possible that teachers cannot develop a training protocol to for minimal pairs, for example. And that might not be part of the curriculum yet because this seems not to be as relevant or as known. But I'm I'm hoping in the future this this, this becomes part of what it has to be done in terms of language training, language learner exposure. Just because to say to everyone, minimal pairs. It's the um, it's just the the change in the vowel sound. Mm -hmm. Just a, okay. okay. Wow. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. And so, you would you envisage the pedagogy centre or the pedagogy research group working closer with teachers in the future? Well. We work with teachers right now, actually. Okay. Uh, okay. But what I've, but not necessarily uh, in this area of perception. Uh, uh, okay. But we're working on something related to what you you mentioned uh, before we recorded, and it is how um, this learning and teaching the language is also an emotional has an emotional aspect to it, right? And so how uh, my mindset affects the way yeah. I teach and the, and the ways I learn. And so we've uh -huh. been working with teachers in terms of how your perception of your own ability to use a language affects your, your, uh, your classroom practices, your methods, your didactics, and, and the expectations you have for your students. So we've been doing growth mindset with teachers, with uh, language teachers. Interesting. And, uh, so. mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think I think we'll finish there. Um, thank you very much again for agreeing to do this interview. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're gonna put just to say to everyone, we're gonna put this interview as a whole interview up on the channel, but we may put also segments. <laughs> related to the different questions just in case people want to just pick out what they want to learn um, thank you so much dr garcia um, that was really fascinating um, thank I, you james 
and we'll 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 uh, we'll look forward to seeing your comments under the video. Please make a comment under the video. Join the discussion, like the video, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.